Good morning, church. Can you hear the sound? I don't hear this word. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Well, you can hear me here. I don't know if they can hear me online. Now they can. <laughs> happy Sabbath online. Happy Sabbath here at home. And um, this is the last happy Sabbath that we're able to give to each other in this year, at least on a Sabbath, right? Um, 2020 is coming to an end. So next Sabbath, uh, 2021, first Sabbath of the new year. Hello, Julius. Welcome. Coming to an end. Amen. When one thing comes to an end, that means something else is going to begin. Amen. And uh, so a new and better year in 2021 is what we hope and pray for. But we're also thankful. Uh, I am very thankful that God got us through 2020. Amen. Amen. There have been some uh, difficult days. Um, there have been losses of jobs, losses of health, losses of life. Uh, some of our families have experienced um, COVID and uh, recovered, and others around this United States and the world have had to lay their loved ones to rest. And so as we wrap up this year, we're looking forward to a new year of hope, and that hope, hopefully, for you is in Jesus. People put their hope in many things these days. But today we're going to have one more time to look at God's word and be inspired and encouraged to put our hope in Jesus. Now, in preparation for that, we're going to have um, opening prayer. I'm going to call Elder Eric up to have our morning invocational prayer. Um, and then um, this morning's special music is going to be tied into the message. So we'll actually start the message and then have the special music. And um, let me just tell you now, that'll get you prepared. If you have your Bible app on your phone, since we are not having hymnals in the pews at this time, it is hymn number 142. And uh, we're not going to sing it as a hymn. It is going to be, uh, it has been prepared uh, on a video by a group that will be on the screen. But I'd like you to look at the words as they sing. Look at the words and let those words sink in. And it's going to be a part of our, our message today. And that'll be a way that you can participate in that song um, by pulling it out and just taking a look at the words as they sing. All right. With that being said, uh, let me uh, invite you to join me this morning as we welcome the Lord on this uh, Christmas Sabbath and this last Sabbath of 2020. Let's pray. Father God, <clears throat> thank you for those that are able to join us this morning in person and online, uh, whether they're joining us by Facebook or Zoom or uh, seeing us through some other internet avenue. Uh, we thank you very much for them. We pray, Lord, that uh, each one of us would feel gratitude that you have brought us to this day. And as we're looking, uh, in a sense, back at 2020, the Sabbath, um, help us to be reminded that um, very soon we are going to be looking forward to 2021, and next week will be a new year. And um, with that, Lord, uh, just like your grace, just like forgiveness, just like the cross event, which was the culmination of the birth event in Bethlehem, help us to remember that with every ending, with every forgiveness, with every gratefulness of the past, there is a transitioning to the future. May that future have hope and we be encouraged. Maybe, maybe we'd be enthused about our part to play in this new year. And uh, may we anticipate your return. And may we do so while we also think about who we might yet minister to and call to join us in awaiting your return, to join us in a relationship with Jesus, a saving relationship with Jesus, to join us as we anticipate the second coming and 
We thank you for the first coming that made that possible, made the second coming possible. And we thank you this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I hope you say happy Sabbath to the Lord today. Last opportunity to do so in 2020. And as I uh, stepped out into the cold this morning and felt uh, the little bite of the cold air, I was very appreciative of what the Lord did for us last week. Anybody else? Uh, for those that joined us online or, or in person, and the in-person ones felt it more, I was very concerned on Thursday and Friday, some of you were watching the weather like I was, that we were going to have a cold morning. Matter of fact, I even got up last Sabbath and I was thinking heavily, should I send an email out to everybody? Should I try to call people to plead with them to bring blankets, to bring coats? I was very concerned that y'all were going to be cold and shivering out there. And uh, then I was thinking maybe people won't even come. And last Sabbath was so beautiful. The weather was so good. Um, sunny, clear skies. It warmed up quick enough that by 11 o'clock, I didn't need a jacket. I don't know about you. Uh, we each have different body temperatures, but I was very appreciative that if, if this Sabbath would have been last Sabbath, it would be a different day to have a drama out in that front lawn. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for coming out today and joining us, whether online or here. And at this time, I'd like to call Elder Eric forward. If you have prayer requests, he may ask you to raise hands. If not, put your mind in that regard. If you're able to kneel, we're going to be doing that. If not, just lean forward in the pew. And I turn the time over to him as we prepare for intercessory prayer. Not on? Not on. Oh, I thought I could do it, but we have many Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Uh, I'll have to repeat it. Last week I was handed a card from Michelle Cruz, and it was a card from our interim pastor, Albert Elaine Ellis. And I talked to them the day before Christmas, and they are doing well, and they are just happy as they can be in the facility in Orlando, the church facility for retired people. And they are doing well, and they send their greetings to everybody this morning. So here I'm bringing it to you. They are just dear people, and we. Most of you remember them when they were here. They loved us all, and they did a good service while they were here. And I would invite you to kneel as we talk to the Lord this morning. Our oh, merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for we have celebrated your first coming uh, over 2,000 years ago. And as we celebrate that, we realize that you are about to come back. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us that assurance that we feel that and that we walk that close with you day by day because we want to be ready when you come to take us home. So bless us all this morning as we are hearing a message of your love and care. Amen. And we see it in so many ways, Lord, and we appreciate it. And we appreciate all you do for not only the people that are claiming to walk in with you, but you are walking or you are taking care of the people all over the world and thank you lord for that because we know that you created all of us and you love us all and you would love to take us all home to the eternal kingdom but that may not happen lord 
For we ask that you will bless each one here this morning as we are worshiping you today. And keep us reminded that the time is running short and you are about to come and take us home. So bless us this morning. Bless our pastor as he brings the message. May it be an uplifting message. And Lord, we ask that you would forgive our sins because we have all done wrong from time to time. And we appreciate you for your forgiveness that we see and we feel in so many times. So bless us this morning and bless this service, Lord. And may it remind us that you are a loving heavenly father and you are reaching down <coughs> to us this morning with your blessings. Thank you, Lord, so for that. Thank you. Because we know that you ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's getting warm in here now. If you uh, need to peel your jacket, do so. And uh, maybe we should get this door cracked a little bit if we can get a deacon to do that. It'll cross draft going. <clears throat> Try to keep a balance between the warmth and the fresh air. All right, well, again, happy Sabbath. And uh, I don't know how many of you most of the people I can see in the congregation probably have driven a car before. I had a nice drive over here this morning, um, but that's not always been the case. Have you ever been in the car behind the wheel and started feeling vibration? Huh. Uh, this morning I asked Plant City, when that happens, what's probably the problem? <clears throat> And I think we spent five minutes going through diagnostic issues. I thought it was going to be a straightforward first uh, response. Uh, and nobody thought of my first response. Um, we thought of, uh, a uh, uh, we thought of uh, alignment, thought of uh, rod, tie, uh, oh my goodness, the uh, support system. What would you say? Thank you. That's what I was trying to say. Tie rod ends. Uh, a ball in the in the coming out the side of the tire, all kinds of different things, and I was looking for a much simpler one that has to do with um, balance. It's something that every tire gets when you get a tire, and if you ever bought a tire and noticed and watched them actually do it, they put the uh, take the old one off, put the new rubber tire on your metal rim, and uh, blow it up, and then they don't stick it on your car. They put it on a spinner that spins your tire. And it starts well, it usually doesn't sound that way though, because that sound is a balanced sound. They usually start going because every tire is imperfect. They're made like us. They're made as perfectly as possible, but sin has defected every one of us in some way or another. And so when we try to live a perfect life centered in God, we usually wobble. We wobble somehow. And we need to have someone add something to our life to bring that balance back. Now, at the tire shop, they take these little <clears throat> uh, lead clips, weights, and they will take a rubber hammer and clip that on to the rim at the right spot so that the whoop, 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 whoop turns into whoop, 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 and it's a nice, even tire. Then you put that back on your car and you get a nice smooth ride. But when that up north, when you have winter time and the freezing and the thawing and the freezing and thawing causes the asphalt to break up and you get what we call uh, chuck holes. Now, I don't know as many chuck holes down here. There, there, there are some, but not, not as many as up north. And some of those chuck holes can get big and uh, they can break your tie rod in but, uh, or, or your, make your tire go flat. But they can also 
cause those weights to pop off. And so I've had a tire that was a good smooth running car that one day all of a sudden started to vibrate because the weight had popped off. And the tire that had been balanced now was out of balance and began to vibrate. In 2020, how has your balance been? Have you maintained a balance? Did you ever have one in 2020? Would you like to get one? You wanna get back to one? Today's message is about our need to always be balanced, about our need for God to apply the weight in the right spot in our life to bring balance back to our life. Because it, with our best human attempts, sin will cause us to wobble in some way or another. And uh, today we're going to talk about what, the, what difference it made when God sent Jesus into the world in terms of bringing balance back to the lives of those who would be willing to receive his grace. And I want to begin by reading the scriptural text, and then I want to invite you to open your hymnals and follow along as we listen to the song related to the scriptural passage. And the text is from Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2. <coughs> Actually, I'm going to read from the New International Version today. Begin with verse 4. Joseph went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee of Judea, to Bethlehem, town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David, and he was going back for the census, and everybody was asked to go back to their hometowns to get this head count. And he also went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terrified. But the angel quickly said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And the town of David was just up the hill from where the shepherds were, several hundred yards, depending on where they were in the field. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign to you how to find that baby. In case there are multiple babies in town, you will find this baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Not a crib, not a house in a stable, in a manger. Suddenly, verse 13 says, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, or NIV says, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left, then and went back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go and see this thing that has happened in Bethlehem that was told us by the Lord. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is, as I said to you earlier, number 142 in the hymnal, number 142. If you will open your app to that location, as I have, and if you don't have an app, maybe close your eyes or focus on the screen as we listen to Angels We Have Heard on High. Oh, 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 oh,
Amen. I was thinking how sometimes older people when I was a young kid used to say, I don't know why you like that music. I don't understand anything it says. Do you know what it says? How can you like the music if you don't know what it's even saying? You ever heard that before? You know that I've been singing this song for years in the church and for years I didn't know what it was saying. And I think we've enjoyed it. So you actually can enjoy music without knowing what the words mean. It's actually true. We do it in church. There's quite a few songs that I don't know all the words to or haven't known all the words to. I've looked them up in more recent years. But growing up as a kid, I just sang the songs. I figured everybody else must know. What is this in excelsis deo? Anybody under 20, can you tell me what that means? You're going to know after this morning, okay? You'll know what you're singing in the future. You know, I was told by adults I should know what I'm listening to in music. I should understand it. But nobody ever told me some of these words that we have and that we sing in our hymns. In excelsis Deo. Well, Gloria is not too difficult, right? I mean, apart from maybe sounding like it's a person's name, Gloria, um, it does sound like the word glory, which sounds like something joyful. And it actually means praise or worship or adoration. It, it is about giving God glory, giving him uh, credit, giving him affirmation, uh, giving him praise. Gloria. In excelsis. Well, you might think of the word accelerator on the car. Vroom. Accelerator, you press it, it goes faster. In this case, turn that into a rocket ship and it goes up. Excel, excel faster, higher. Excelsis is a word that means high. And excelsis, in the highest heaven, in the highest sky. That's referring to how people saw um, people of importance. People who were of less importance or more poor or simple people would always be low. And whenever someone would come before the king, they would bow and make themselves low. The king, however, would never sit on the same level. He would sit up on a stage. He would sit up on a throne. He would sit up high. Whenever people would make worship places, they would build them on mountains. The idea of height was that the higher one was, the greater they were. So in this song, in Excelsis, refers to God being the highest because he is the most powerful, the most great God. And so glory to the highest God, to the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Um, and that's where the, the last word comes in, Deo, which just means God. So literally, it is Glory um, in the highest, God. Those are the three words that are in that song. Now, we have to put it together, add a two. Glory in the highest to God to make a little bit better sense of it in our English today. And that's what the song is about. And that's what the angels were proclaiming in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest. But they don't... They don't put a period. There's no period there. Is there a period in your text? There's actually an and. In Greek, it's the, it's the chi, K-A-I, if you're trying to spell that with English letters. Chi is the Greek word for and. Uh, I, Y, if you're speaking Spanish. In English, and means something added onto, something with. When you say that uh, I and my wife are together, you probably don't have to say even together. The and implies that you're together by using and, my wife and I, that you're not two separate individuals, but that the and puts you together as a package. This text also has a package, another part. Let's look at it again. Luke 2. Luke 2. <clears throat> Glory to God in the highest heaven. And, there's the and, the other part, the rest of the package, on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. On earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. There's the other part to it. 
glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. You remember that Jesus, when he uh, later had grown up and he came to the temple after he was, um, you know, received the, the Holy Spirit, was baptized by John, began his earthly ministry, he read from the scriptures, Isaiah 61. And in that passage, he talks about the Spirit being upon him and how he's come to bring deliverance to the captives, sight to the blind, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That was a comment referring to the Jubilee every seven years in which everything would be right at all, debts would be canceled. And in this case, God through Christ was going to cancel every debt of everyone through the cross event. So Jubilee was being hearkened to not only in, in Isaiah 61, Jesus was owning it as a part of his mission and purpose on earth. And it was spoken of right here by the angels when Jesus was born in a babe and hadn't yet realized his mission and purpose. When they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men who receive his favor. His favor, his forgiveness, his grace. That's what Jubilee is all about. It's the year of grace, the year of forgiveness. If you are um, a mother and have children, children, plural, is easier than a child, like my father was an only child, but when you have two or three or more, um, this illustration will help us to understand something about God. I know that there are always moms that have issues where this may not play out, but a, a typical, what we call a good mom, has a desire for her children to love each other, to play together well, to share their things. And when they are in a room, mom maybe is making something, cooking something, cleaning up, doing something in the other room, and she overhears a problem where they are, and she comes in to check it out. It's disturbing to see that the kids are not playing together, sharing with their toys, being nice to each other, being affirming, loving, when they start bickering and fighting and so on. And mom comes in to make peace. And it's a very strange thing that moms must go through when one child says, but mom, we really love you. You know, when she says something like, I got this out of order here. <laughs> when she comes in and she says, I'm really disappointed in you all, or I feel really sad, you know, and she kind of gets to express her emotions that she's not happy with what's going on. And they say, but mom, we really love you, but, but you're not loving each other. No, we really love you though, mom. Well, if you're not loving each other, I don't feel your love for me. I hear it. But when I feel your love for me, I see your love for each other. They go together. There is something about children learning to love each other that blesses the hearts of moms. I know it blesses my wife a whole lot. And she continually teaches that to our children. The most important thing is that they always, as they grow up, love and support each other. And my children do that. Our children do that largely because my wife has ingrained them with the idea that there's no such thing as loving her without loving each other that goes together. But something has happened in our world through sin, I'm sure, that has allowed us, some of us anyway, to think that we can love God and not have to love each other. It's a very strange thing. It's um, like this piece of wood right here. We all want to be balanced, and we want to walk the line. We want to walk in a balanced way with God, and I don't do it every day, so I can't even stand on this thing without falling. I have to be very careful, and then it fell over. That's right, I'll continue with it on the side. It's a lot easier that way. Um, practice does help, but even our best practice, sometimes we will fall to one side or the other. And the size I see of trying to walk this balanced line that the Lord has created us to walk, and it should be natural, uh, I have seen people walk a tightrope, much thinner than that piece of wood on the floor here, and bring a stove out onto it and cook pancakes or eggs or breakfast on a tightrope. I can't do that. Can you? 
I, I can't imagine how that's even real. I look at that and say, are there hidden wires? Or... It seems so unreal. But this person has walked on the tightrope so long for so many years, gotten so used to it, that walking on the tightrope is almost as natural as you and I walking on the ground. And that happens from practice, experience. That's what God does as he sanctifies us on a day-to-day -day basis. As we have an experience, a relationship with him, he grows us. But without that, without that, we tend to fall to one side or the other. Now, one side is very easy for us to understand. A lot of church people understand people that fall to the side that focus only on people. They focus on loving people, hanging out with people, having a good time, partying, enjoying life. And God... Don't really need him. I'm doing great over here. That's one side to fall on. Church people tend to understand that side, and they call people out of that to repent and come into the church. The problem is we don't always inform people that there's another side that's just as deadly. And so some people do come over. They feel the deadness, <clears throat> excuse me, the deadness of that, the dead end of that way of life. And they now perceive, because they're imbalanced, remember, they didn't get balanced because they came to God. They just brought their unbalanced tire to the other side. So now they perceive that what they're going to do to fix it is they're going to focus all their attention on God like they put all their attention on people in the world. And now words and traditions and behavior, God becomes their only focus. I'm going to give glory to God. I'm not going to care about the people. People are lost. I'm going to be saved. I'm going to focus on God. Another imbalanced approach. This text brings them both together. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those who accept God's favor. The person of God is like Christ. In Christ, he did both. You know, we've always had trouble historically. All the way back to Adam and Eve, Moving forward, we've had trouble being consistent on walking the line, on balancing our lives. And we, usually, we give up on, on trying to balance and usually go one side or the other because it's easier to do one or the other. Be in the world all the way. Be only about God. Not realizing that you can't be only about God. Because if you and I are really about God... Surely you must have discovered it. The more we really get to know God, the more he says, it's time to get out there and love your neighbor. It's time to treat others like you want to treat me because they're your brother. I made them too. They're also in my image, just like you are. And I didn't die just for you. Yes, I would have died if it was only you, but it wasn't only you. And so I didn't die just for you. I died for the whole world. And God will receive everyone to him. But the next thing he does is send them back. Do you remember the demoniacs who came? One scripture has one demoniac. The other one talks about two. It's irrelevant whether they were one or two right now. The point is that the demoniac who was in the graves cutting themselves, they had been chained to try to protect, themse protect themselves from themselves and from others. They were even breaking the chains. They were so filled with demons and so... Uh, filled with evil, and Jesus came into their presence and healed them, and peace came over them. This is the story where the pigs run down because he cast the demons into the pigs, and they run down into the water, and the people of the town say, get out of here. You just, you just caused us to lose our whole livelihood. You sent all of our pigs that was our income down into their death, and now we're going to starve, and they were pretty upset about what Jesus did. Well, in that story, don't miss this. The natural response of those who are saved is, take me with you, Jesus. You've saved me. I'm changed. I'm, I'm different. I want to go with you. A lot of young men, when they uh, come to the Lord, one of the first things that, at least in the past, I don't know if it's still happening, but when I came into the church, a lot of young men, the first thing they thought is, well, if I'm accepting the Lord as my Savior, I probably need to become a pastor. That was a popular and so the pastor that I was baptized by, when I asked him the question, how do you know if you're saved? Uh, excuse me. How do you know when you're saved that you're to join, you need to be a pastor? How do you know if you're called to be a pastor? 
And this pastor said, if you can stay a Christian, a Seventh Adventist Christian, and do anything else in the world, you should do it. If you are called to be a pastor, you won't be happy doing anything else until you answer the call to be a pastor. But he says there are many people who think that's what they should do because they've been saved, and all men are not called to be pastors. So don't think because you're a man or a male and have been saved that that's what you must do. The Lord will lead you if that is what he's calling you to do, but every male doesn't need to be a pastor to serve God. Don't think that. These men thought I just was saved by Jesus. Surely to serve him, I must go with him. Jesus said, no, 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 no. No, you don't need to go with me. But you just saved us. We're so thankful. We want to go with you and be where you are. No, 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 no. I have a bigger plan for you than hanging around with me. What? A bigger plan? What could be bigger than hanging around with you? Well, here's the plan. Go back to your family. Go back to your hometown. And tell everybody what happened when you met me. Tell them what I did for your life. And they did that. And the Bible says that about a year or so later, Jesus came back to that same Decapolis, that same area, where the people had told him to get in a boat and get out of here. And this time, the people came from the 10 cities that were around that area and brought multitudes of people who were sick, who were ill, who were diseased, who were needing a Savior to Jesus because of the men who went back and told them what Jesus had done for them. They now wanted Jesus to do something for them as well. And they came to meet Jesus. What am I saying? I'm saying that coming to God is good, important, and needful for all of us. But hanging around God all the time, so much time that we have no time to go into the world and share Him with others, is not being more holy. It's being imbalanced. Boom, 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 like a tire. Balance is when we know when we are to go in with God and when it's time to go out. You remember Jesus saying he is the good shepherd and that he will lead his flock in and out? Go back and read that passage. He doesn't lead his flock into the corral and keep them there. He leads them in and he leads them out. A part of a sheep's life is in the field, walking in the wilderness. Another part is in the corral and in the pen. And the shepherd goes with them in and out. And Jesus wants to lead us in 2021, not only into church, into the Bible, into prayer, but also into the world with a word about what Jesus has done for us to share with somebody else so that we give God the glory by giving others his love just like moms feel love when their children love each other. So when we love our neighbor as ourselves, when we share our faith in Jesus, when we treat each other with kindness, when we don't let the separations that this past year we've experienced in the United States separate us, when people can say, there's something different about your church. I see that there is separation from old to young in the world, but there doesn't seem to be that the young people love the older people, the older people love the young people in your church. There is separation out there between blacks and whites and Asians and Hispanics and all the different cultures. But in the church, when people say, you know, I see that there are Hispanics and there are blacks and there are whites and there are Asians and you all seem to love each other. You get along. All we know is there are things that happen behind the scenes that sometimes they don't always get along. But there's a general sense that we get along because that's evidence that God is with us. And when it's not happening, it's evidence that we need to get back on our knees. We need to get back into his word. We need to get closer to Jesus because when we get closer to Jesus, we're able to be closer to each other. That's what empowers us because Jesus came to give God glory by also and at the same time bringing peace into his churches. Peace is not for everywhere. There's always going to be wars in the world. Jesus came to bring division between the insiders and the outsiders. But within the church, he said in John 17 that one of the evidences 
that the world would have that God sent him and that he sent his church into the world, one of those evidences would be the way we love each other as well as loving him. Those two go together. You can't love God all the way with all your being and not love your brother or sister. Neither can I. And we can't truly love our brother and sister as well as we as is possible for us to love our brother and sister without loving God because he will give us the ability to love in those areas where our humanness causes conflict with our brother and sister. <coughs> Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Rests, stays, abides. Jesus came to bring favor. He came to bring a jubilee of sorts. Jesus still is offering that favor this Christmas and every day throughout this end of the year and the new year coming. But the challenge is for you and I to choose to keep the favor he gives. It's one thing to receive his favor. It's another thing to hold on to it. To live a life of favor is to be one who shares his favor with others. Because he's forgiven me, I forgive you. Because he loves me, I love you. Because he shared with me, I share with you. Because he hasn't discounted me for being white, I don't discount you for being some other color. Because he hasn't discounted me for speaking English instead of Hebrew or Greek, I don't discount you for speaking something different than I speak. When we begin to see that Jesus, holding on to him, holding on to his grace, is the power to transform us, maybe it'll help us in the new year to look for ways to hold on to him better, to consider how many days a week do we open the Bible and look for Jesus in it? How many days of the week do we kneel for a moment in prayer? Or, since kneeling is not a magic position, do we talk to God as to a friend wherever we are, in the shower, on the way to work, in the middle of an argument? These are the things that connect us with God. As Jesus came into the world in Bethlehem and was born, he went out of the world on the cross, which culminated his saving grace. And then he said to us, take up your cross and follow me. What is your cross? Where is it that this year you need to invite Jesus to join you? Jesus, I can do this well, but maybe at work I don't balance well. I fall on one side or the other. Jesus, join me at work and help me walk the beam. Jesus, join me at home. I'm great at work. I'm great at school, but at home it's really tough. If people at church saw the way it was at home, they would they would know we need more of you in our lives. What about at church? For some people, they're great at work and they're great at school and they're great at home, but at church, there's some people sit, you know, one place, some people sit in another place because they're not like those people. You know, those people, what they believe. I hope we don't have that in our church, but 2021, good news is even if we do, it can be, it can be eradicated. It can be overcome. What do you need to overcome in 2021? Don't try to do it alone realize that because through history we haven't done well when we've done it alone, even though we've tried, we've been imbalanced. And balance is when we make Jesus the center. When Jesus becomes the center of your life, and you know that there's a portion, a portion of your life that it needs to be spent with God, there's a portion of your life that needs to be spent with others, that those two things will be balanced when Jesus becomes a center because he lived a life where he put God first and others second consistently all through his life. He didn't segregate people or judge people based upon their differences, but loved them as one. This Christmas, I realized that I need more of Jesus in my life. Anybody else realize that? I want to be good. I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better husband. 
I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better citizen. And I, I need to realize anew, and I'm realizing anew and telling myself as I'm telling you, that if I'm serious about that, I need to schedule time in to do certain things with God for those other things to happen. I can't go try to make those things happen, be better at all those things, and come back and say, God, look, I did this for you. Because the very thing I need to achieve success in those things is God in the first place. I can't do it without him to bring him the gift of my perfection. Rather, I need to invite him into my imperfect life so that together we can experience perfection through the process of sanctification, giving glory to God in the highest and bringing peace and grace upon the earth, at least in my circumference and the people around me. This is the prayer <clears throat> that I have or the, or, or the invitation I have for you today is that each of, a, each of you would search your hearts and ask, Lord, where is it that I need to invite you in that I've left you out? Wherever that is, invite Jesus in. Invite him to hang out with you. Invite him to be with you. That's all he wants. Remember Emmanuel, God with us, the hope of glory, the hope of of you changing, the hope of me changing. Salvation, as it were, that came upon the earth will only reveal itself in more powerful ways in our life when we are able to center on Jesus and let him be involved in everything. When we get up, when we lay down, when we go to work, when we go to school, when we get in an argument, when we plan a vacation, when we get a raise, when we lose a job, when we get sick, when we get better. Don't leave him out. Don't save him for church time, devotional time. All the time. You are all the time holy when you're with God. And God wants you holy all the time. W-H-O-L-L-Y. If that's your desire to be more wholly connected with God through Christ this coming year, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. And if it's not your desire, I'm going to pray that God will make it your desire this year, that somehow you'll have enough loss, enough need in your life that you realize he's had his hand out the whole time and he's willing to fill that need for you as well. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your love for each one that is here today. <clears throat> Help us to not work so hard to cover up our flaws in 2021. Help us not work so hard to cover up our flaws by pointing out the flaws of others in 2021. Help us not to be caught up in the imbalance of being focused on people so much that we forget about you or to be focused on the imbalance of being focused so much on what we call you that we forget about loving people. Because the two work hand in hand. May this year truly be a year of glory to God in the highest and peace to those who accept his grace and good favor. Help us to accept that by accepting Jesus. Jesus who came and whose whole life gave you glory and demonstrated favor to those around him. Thank you for your love and grace this Christmas as we wrap up 2020. May we not go into the new year without you at our side. Today, if we say, yes, Jesus, I want to be your best friend. I want you to be my best friend. I pray that with that, each one here will think about the time of the day that we will read our Bibles, the time of the day that we will have a few words with Jesus, and the ways that we will write him into our appointment books, schedule him into our lives, or increase the time if we already have him in, two times a day to read 
two times a day to pray. A time a day to love somebody, to call somebody, to encourage somebody, to pray with somebody instead of just for somebody. This year, Father God, help us write you into our lives and make you the center. And you will balance us once again, or perhaps for the very first time. And the wobble and the thumping will turn into a hum. And that's what we're looking for, to be delivered and saved in 2021 by Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been a very interesting year. As I said, next week, it'll be a new year already. Hard to believe. I hope to see each one of you then. If not, I hope to see you in the new Jerusalem. If anything should cause us to fall along the wayside or move from here, um, always keep Jesus with you. Make him the center. And he will bring us back together again. God bless you. God love you. We'll see you soon.